Great. Hi, welcome, and thank you for attending. We're basically just going to give you some uh, experiences that we've had in generating a news game uh, in the real world. Hopefully, it'll be useful to you. I'm Lindsay Grace, Night Chair in Interactive Media at the University of uh, Miami, and this is... I am Romina Ruiz Guadiana. I'm currently a national correspondent with USA Today, but this work was done at my time at the Miami Herald. Great. So let's just get that deck started and show you what we've got. So uh, I'm a professor, game designer, developer, artist, and author. I wear a lot of hats. And most germane to this particular conversation is my experience as a solo game designer developer, where I produced more than 25 games uh, in this context as a developer, artist, and designer. Uh, I've also done some commercial solo development, uh, large, sort of, largely sort of apps and uh, the various app stores. And I've done a variety of projects uh, with my colleagues and peers and with students around social impact games, trying to generate uh, timely topics as quickly as possible, but also trying to get into uh, spaces that I think uh, benefit from game design. Uh, as mentioned, I'm the 2019 Games for Change Vanguard Award winner. I'm very thankful to the organization for that. And I've also written more than 75 books, chapters, articles, et cetera, on games largely focused on social impact, on educational game design, et cetera. Uh, most germane to this topic as a resource and what informs some of the work that we did here is my book, Doing Things with Games, Social Impact Through Play, which largely focuses on a kind of how-to. And uh, likewise, uh, the, the book Love and Electronic Affection, which is an edited collection of essays on how to design thinking about uh, empathy and thinking about uh, relationships within games. And lastly, uh, as I discussed at the last Games for Change, we also did a, a very comprehensive analysis of the state of news games, what's working, what's not working. And uh, this particular report is completely free and available to everyone. You can also get a printed version if you'd like to pay. So, as you guys know, my name is Romina Ruiz Guadiana. I know it's a very, very complicated name. Um, I have almost 15 years of experience. I started as a foreign correspondent in Israel and then progressively made my way closer and closer to the United States by way of Latin America. And this investigation that Lindsay and I worked on is called Gaming the System. We had, this is a, a completely collaborative effort. We had a you know, partnership with the University of Miami School of Communication with the National Association for Hispanic Journalists for the, with the University of Florida's Breckner Center for Freedom of Information and with one of our biggest sponsors, the Fund for Investigative Journalism. And um, as the, the project got bigger, uh, we had, uh, Oh, an illustrator, we had contributing reporters from the region. And as we got closer and closer to the end, a team of other folks. So the idea here was really to think about a choose your own adventure. This was actually my first uh, foyer into actually wanting to think about a game. Uh, based on investigative journalism. So my driving forces, I'm a, a narrative writer, I can read and write 5,000 words, but I really feel that in terms of finding new audiences and trying to explain really, really complicated concepts, sometimes in an experience like a game, I wanted to really figure out if we could fig if we could reduce all of our reporting to an experience on U.S. immigration policy, which changes every single U.S. Ad administration. In terms of our success, we had 47,321 people play from October 20th, 2020 till January 1st of this year in 29 countries. So how did we get started with, you know, how did I get started with this idea? It's actually based on at least 10 years of work when I was a foreign correspondent in Guatemala where I track the links between political elites and drug trafficking and political elites and money laundering and um, human trafficking. And the connection of a lot of my colleagues that published the Paradise Papers, which talk about um, to offshoring, uh, offshoring money and also the Pulitzer Prize winning Panama Papers. 
So all of these investigations over the last five, six years revealed um, a list of people, a list of people that were elites in Latin America that were able to hide their assets. And by now, a couple years in, many of them were wanted by the uh, ministries of justice and the authorities of their countries. And it so happens that all of them had property and real estate and visas, if not green cards, or were on their way to becoming US citizens in the United States. And at this crucial moment where the, the former US President Donald Trump was had an entire rhetoric and an entire administration moving um, against undocumented immigrants, there was this class that was basically navigating by completely undetected. And in some cases, some of them had links to the former administration. So as you can imagine, trying to explain and crunch 10 years of stories and big investigations into one, you know, the best idea was a game. And as I said before, I am not the game person. Well, after this, I'm probably more of a game person, but the idea was, I, I thought about it like one of those pop quizzes that you used to have in the 90s in magazines. Yes, no, yes, no. Um, I had a visualization that didn't understand, that had zero knowledge of game theory. And this was my original map. Well, actually this is the computized version of the thing that I did by hand, which I couldn't find, but I would be very embarrassed to show you. <laughs> So we're all about candor, and I thought it would be useful for the Games for Change community to hear kind of how we implemented it, perhaps as a sort of roadmap for how you might do this work yourself. So in short, we basically had uh, two roles. Uh, myself as the person responsible for implementation, that meant design development and drafting the art, and Romina as the subject matter expert, uh, responsible for integrating the reporting as well as the rules and uh, the sort of reality of the, the topic. And so you can kind of look at if you need an org chart as Ramina at the top and me there to sort of make this thing happen as developer, designer, and artist. And I think it was a pretty efficient way to uh, get a prototype produced. So this is how we work for the prototype phase. And essentially, if you're unfamiliar with the term, we work towards an MVP, a minimal viable product. And in this case, the MVP was produced in less than five days, which I think is very important when we're talking about news contexts. Uh, we're not necessarily looking for perpetually evergreen solution. We're looking for something that can be released at the pace of news, which is very fast. So in this particular implementation, uh, we, we used Twine. Uh, I originally decided on it for the prototype because it was widely accessible. I really like that it exports, uh, that you can get an HTML5 version, uh, that it's easy to share over social media and that it costs nothing. So in a few hours, we were able to get something that was functional. Uh, it didn't look particularly pretty. It looked like this, uh, basically just like a website. Uh, nothing uh, that I would sort of say, wow, this really looks playful, but the idea was to explore the potential for even being a playful topic. And so within a few days, we'd actually implemented something that looked much more like this. Uh, it looks a little more playful, looks a little more like a choose your adventure that you might, uh, you might actually want to play. And so one of the things to note is that uh, I am not an, a traditional artist per se. Uh, I'm a sort of digital artist, but in order to get this kind of work done quickly, I wasn't going to do it by hand. So we employed Photoshop filters for an original aesthetic, try to do something that was a little Miami, but also a little um, hinted at sort of hand hewn. Uh, also really just derived simple art from public domain. So in this one, it's a composite of two uh, public domain images. And these were good for uh, helping to get some context and help the illustrator know what we're, we're looking for. And then the other big uh, point in implementation that I think is handy for a designer to recognize is that there was a bit of language design. What I mean by this is it was converting decisions into actions. So the decision might be, are you going to open an S Corp or an LLC or not? And that's a decision, but uh, attaching game verbs like buy, apply, complete made it feel a little more playful. Likewise, uh, you have to, especially with these serious topics, make sure that you remain playful, but uh, also respectful of tone. So there was a lot of uh, balancing act there in language design. And ultimately in terms of implementation, 
uh, what was what we did was we exported the twine source files as text files and then kind of revised the copy. And often in these cases, there's a question about the pipeline. How do I actually produce this stuff? How do I work with other people in particularly twine, which doesn't work well for um, for uh, multiple people using it at once? It's not very good at this. So uh, one of the things I, I found that I thought was very useful is something called Poof. Uh, it's a utility for twine. So basically, we produced. Uh, I made something in twine. We exported through Poof, created a PDF that turned into a Google Doc that we could both look at and revise the script. Poof is available here at twinelab.com slash poof. And uh, the, the, the thing that was a little tricky is the going the other way. So once we made those changes to the script, how do we move it backward? And for that, unfortunately, it was really manual entry uh, from Google Docs to Twine, keeping in mind that there was real no budget attached to this. So admittedly, uh, I'm sure there is probably a better solution out there because this was tedious and awkward. Uh, it really did because we didn't have great version control. It was just two people working together. This uh, did become a little slow and a little awkward. We also, as is common in any game project, had to cut some features. So shown here is a, a meter we played with that was an anonymity meter so that um, one of the things you were trying to do is not have your um, lose your anonymity because then you would be detected, you'd be caught. Uh, but obviously features have to get cut just to make things work well. And then as we got close to actual release, the team expanded in the final weeks. And that's when we did things like migrate it to GitHub so we could do version control as well as um, apply CSS cascading style sheets standards. Again, benefit of uh, using uh, Twine is that we it's basically an HTML page so we can uh, apply the same standards across the different brands. So the two brands that are associated here. Uh, generally, this is all to kind of summarize for you on the implementation side that in my experience, you get 90% of the way there very quickly. And it's that last 10% that tends to be the long haul. So it's very easy to quick, create a quick prototype. It's not always easy to make sure that that prototype meets the standard of a professional release. And so um, I think it's important for anyone venturing into this space to recognize that. So what are the things that we learned? The first and most important thing is that news, news games can be made through collaborations. And I would actually say that the best work um, actually happens not when you have news games people inside of your newsroom, but when they are actually working outside. Uh, that way, the journalism and the news part is concentrated in the subject matter ex, uh, expertise, and then the game maker is also the one that is going to navigate and actually um, create that experience that you want the audience to have. One of the things that I learned personally is that games are completely different than interactives, and that was something that was very revelatory to all of our edit, all of my editors, right? Because interactives um, will provide user feedback, but what games do is that it supports play and it creates these structures so that they're, it's replicating agency, and it can go in many many different directions. And I think it keeps audiences much more engaged, and uh, it's an incredible vehicle for storytelling. So the other thing that I think is important to recognize here, and I'm sure if you've, you've been following this kind of work for years, then you're familiar with um, Ian Bogos, you're familiar with a variety of other folks uh, who are doing this work around trying to make complex systems easier to understand through games. And so as I you know, sort of met initially, all of these like, references came to mind. I, I thought of the Uber game. I, um, I thought of uh, Parable of the Polygons. I thought of McDonald's games. These, there's lots of playable um, models precedent and research and anyone who's doing this kind of work should really start there uh, and recognize that there is um, there are lessons to be learned from those. So you know you can have a great game but if no one is playing it then nobody knows that it's a great game. So what did we learn? Number one that social media spread is essential. 63% more or less of our traffic um, and of our players got to us through social media. Also, one of the things that was super, super interesting is that there's an international appetite for this, which was incredibly surprising to me. Especially given that it was US immigration, yeah. If you look at this table, um, you can see that 70% of our players were in Mexico and then followed after uh, very closely 
12%, 12.71% from Colombia, and then a 12.03 from the United States. And it went as far as Australia. So one of the reasons that uh, I'd emphasize that the sort of value of Twine or solutions like Twine is this web accessibility. Uh, it's clearly important uh, if you're trying to get a wide audience that you make sure that it is a, a web accessible solution, something that can be played across a variety of devices and across a variety of networks and quality of networks. So people with slow connections aren't bothered or are unable to play. So uh, as you can see from this uh, chart, what we're trying to demonstrate is uh, generally what uh, clients, what kinds of um, web clients people were using. And overwhelmingly, you, you can see that we got a lot of traffic from Facebook, uh, which again is of the bulk of our, um, our social media spread. And then you'll also notice that uh, there are some nuances in having a product that may be of interest to a Latin American audience uh, and the relationship to Facebook. So the other thing to note is the percentage of players by platform, and you should see this immediately in our quick little chart, that it's predominantly uh, mobile users. So people were playing this largely on the phone as opposed to sitting down at a desktop, which is an antiquated expectation in my opinion. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to share with you from my perspective is generally a sense of momentum because I think it's important to recognize particularly in news, ga in news games. So you can see we got up to about 44,000 on uh, the 26th of October last year. And uh, our general release, we had a little bit of a pre-release, but our general release is here. And you can see that there's this peak, this really strong peak. And then by November 1st or so, it really does decline. The, the topic, you know, all the articles, I believe at this point were all released. There was a series. And so all the, all the chatter around it and all the social media buzz around it is largely centered around that release. And it almost looks as though it tapers off incredibly, but ultimately it's just to note that interest isn't necessarily sustained. And this could be for a variety of reasons. So there are your daily users um, numbers who are already down to 657 in November. And this is really just full disclosure. It's more interesting to look at the slope if you look at it without that peak of 44,000, which is what's been removed here. And you'll notice immediately that what we have is a variety of people who are um, dropping off at the very end. Um, so, and you know, just to wrap it up here from the news perspective and from the journalism perspective, you know, the three, the four points would be that data is absolutely essential for accountability reporting, but game theory is a necessary vehicle for storytelling. Uh, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, uh, and games provide a different entry point into a story that would otherwise, you know, be confounded or confused with the rest of the paper. And most interestingly uh, for, uh, for me and for us, I think, is that Latin American audiences are hungry for new formats and entry points into investigative journalism. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this is Lindsay Grace and Romina. Uh, we will uh, meet you in the Q&A if you have more questions or want more uh, observations from our project. Thank you so much. Thank you.